think that I might use this. I like to move around just a little bit, unless it's going to cause a problem with the video. Is it going to cause a problem with the video if I move? Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, first of all, this is... I love coming to PyCon UK. One more round of applause for all of the organizers. You know, I spent a, a couple of years uh, heading up PyCon US, and I can tell you it is an amazingly draining experience to be running a conference. What you don't realize is that what you see then, this, this flurry of activity that you see right now, is only the tip of the iceberg. In fact, all the, most of the time that they were losing sleep was in the months preceding this, where they were trying to organize everything. This, right now, they're just going on adrenaline. There's practically nothing left. And so, when, you, when, they, when they said, you see one of the cast, the, the crew members give them a hug, uh, well, I, said, I think that they said give a hug to sponsors. Do that, please do that too. But also give hugs to the, the crew members because they have put in a lot of work over a lot of time. And what you see here is just the tip of it. So I am here today to talk about ecosystem threats to Python. And I come to this from sort of a unique perspective. I work in the office of the CTO at, at Rackspace, and part of what I do there is I am responsible for organizing all of our engagement with the various communities that we, that we work with. Now these aren't just uh, open source communities, this is any sort of technical community. And we need to look at these things and say, who's, who's thinking about them, what are their relationships to our company, uh, etc. And so I'm in a position to actually see what things are growing, what things are shrinking, how the different players interact. Part of what we do is we gather data about how uh, about the importance of various communities and how they interact with each other so that we can do things like if you're a Windows developer, if your top 10 technologies are blah 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 or if you're a Linux developer, your top 10 are, are these things. And so it actually allows me to see the connections between communities and how they, they interact. I also, as well as working with uh, Python, I also work with the Linux Foundation, with the OpenStack Foundation. So I see a fair amount of this. Now, the, when I talk about ecosystems, I'm talking about this one. Uh, you know, the term software ecosystem came from a book uh, written about 10 years ago. It was 2003 by Messerschmitt and, and by somebody with the last name that starts with an S. Uh, Sapersky, I believe it is. So in this book, they laid out an extended argument that said all the different roles in software can be thought of just by analogy to an ecosystem. There were different people working, working with each other, trying to one in their terms, trying to exploit this, some, some are trying to create this, and they analogized it to the different roles in a natural uh, physical ecosystem. Now, the terms that they used haven't caught on, except for the one software ecosystem. I think that that is really the dominant way to think about software and how it works together. And when I think about this, especially in the context of Python, I think about it as, we can't just be here, we are part of the ecosystem. We can't just be developing Python here on our own. It has to serve the purposes of users. It has to serve the purposes of teachers. It has to serve the purposes of companies. And all of us have to work together to advance Python. This concept has been so influential that the Redmonk analyst, anyone know Redmonk? A few people. They're a developer-focused analyst. They're probably the only analyst group that I, I listen to. But he wrote, he named his blog Ecosystems, short for technol Technology Ecosystem, because he said, Every, all technology is just an ecosystem. Now, it's true that we could actually spend some time just uh, celebrating here. This is from that same blog. This is from Stephen O'Grady's blog on Redmonk. This is a cross-tabulation of the, 
of the number of active projects on GitHub versus the number of questions on Stack Overflow. And so you, this is, in one way, a measure of popularity. This is what is interesting, you know, how much traffic is there around a particular technology. And these are pro programming languages in particular. And so you could, you can say that we are definitely uh, up there. In fact, we are solidly one of the top four or top five languages. Now, this is an amazing position to be because uh, how many people have been around in the Python community for more than 10 years? 10 years ago, almost exactly, Paul Graham, of, uh, who went on to found Y Combinator, uh, wrote the Python Paradox. And in this, he said, this quote, people don't learn Python because it will get them a job. They learn it because they genuinely like to program and aren't satisfied with the languages they already know. Which makes them exactly the kind of programmers companies should want to hire. Hence what, for lack of a better term, I'll call the Python paradox. If a company chooses to write its software in, in a comparatively esoteric language, they'll be able to hire better programmers because they'll attract only those who cared enough to learn it. And for programmers, the paradox is even more pronounced. The language to learn if you want to get a good job is a language that people don't learn merely to get a job. Now, what really stuck out to me is that 10 years ago, almost exactly, 10 years ago, last month, Python was considered a relatively esoteric language. Now, we're solidly top four, top five. This is a very different position for us. Uh, we, in fact, one of the absolutely abominable publications which I occasionally need to read, CTO uh, Magazine, says that Python is a safe and well-supported uh, language choice for, for enterprise software. Which is <laughs> enterprising. <laughs> Or this. This is a uh, this is a ranking from 2003 through 2013, end of year, of active Python projects versus active Perl projects. Now, back in the late mid to late 90s, Perl was undoubtedly the king of the hill when it came to programming languages, or at least dynamic dynamic programming languages, I should say. Uh, I remember at one point in one point in time, Amazon.com uh, was mostly written in Perl. Uh, you can see that even though Python passed Perl back in 2006, we are now to the point where there are actually, actually almost three times as many active Python projects as active Perl projects, and it's actually only accelerated through this year. Although the new end of year rankings haven't come out yet because we're still in 2014. One of my favorite lesser known examples is actually in of how Python is swallowing whole pieces of, of the computing infrastructure is in the animation industry. A lot of people don't know that Python has become the de facto language for integrating graphic, graphics pipelines. And so Maya, Pixar, Way to Digital, Sony, all of them, everyone has standardized on Python to move assets through the rendering pipeline and create all of the animated movies or CGI renderings that you all know and love. Uh, Python is now actually the most popular teaching language at, at universities in the United States. And it is growing across the world as evidenced by what's happening here in the UK. The, uh, the new programming language curriculum, it's no, it's no accident that Python is really growing here. It's because Python is such a productive language. It makes it really easy to, the ratio of effort to output is really, really good. And that's one reason why, you know, on the long, over the long term, I'm not really worried about Python in terms of the number of users or the number of uses, because it always has that really favorable ratio of effort to output. But that doesn't mean that we don't have issues. 
Such as that, walking off the edge of the stage. Uh, you know, the, uh, while the changes from Python 2 to 3 were necessary, and they have made the language actually much, much better in a lot of ways, it definitely hurt our trajectory. Uh, there are a lot of embedded uses of Python that, frankly, I think it's unlikely that they will ever move off Python 2. Uh, it just is, there are, it's embedded in, in software that's out there, and they're not going to put in a service pack, service pack to their software that's shipped and is no longer supported just to update the, the, the <coughs> Python DLL that they, that they include. Uh, but I didn't actually come to talk about Python 3. It's, it's an issue. Uh, but I actually think that this is one that's being solved. In fact, over the past uh, probably two weeks, I had a wonderful but somewhat unexpected experience of I was doing some programming and one of the libraries that I wanted to use was only supported on Python 3. And if I, need, if I wanted to use Python 2, I would have to go back to the last release. Uh, and so this is, and so, this is one of those things that I think is going to happen more and more. But instead, I want to talk about the threats to the ecosystem and what happens when new predators or new people or new languages, in this case, move in. And so I don't know if you, how many of you know, have been to a Django Con, but they have a, a tradition that every year they have a, con, they have a talk, Why Django Sucks. And so it's somewhat in this mode that I come here. You, you all are familiar with the famous speech by Mark Antony in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, where he begins, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come, not to, to, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. In the same vein, I come to bury Python a little bit and talk about the things that we're doing wrong, or at least the things that other people are doing better than us. Uh, but, and in particular, I'd like to focus on three primary ecosystem competitors. Java, JavaScript, or Node here, and Go. Now, the big question, uh, that is, for, for when we look at this, is why do we care? Um, this is actually a very important question because I want to make clear that in no way do I think that other languages need to lose for Python to win. I think that Python has an amazing set of strengths and it will continue to go on and capitalize on those things. However, it worries me when I see new projects or new programmers either moving from Python to one of these other languages or, or saying, you know what, for this, new for this new project, I'm going to pick up one of these others. And that is because of get it, that gets back to this new idea of the ecosystem. We can't develop and work with Python in a vacuum. Particularly, I like to be paid. I assume that all of you, when working with Python, also similarly like to get paid. Although this is not a necessary condition, it is frequently a very helpful condition for people to invest a lot in Python, is that they get to work with it in a professional context. We have sponsors here at PyCon UK because they care about let's be honest, not about any fuzziness about the community, but because they want to engage with us on a commercial level. They want to hire us. They want to sell to us. Uh, and that is because we have this common underpinning of Python. I want that to continue. And if it doesn't continue, then over time, things like PyCon UK will shrink. And I don't want that to happen. The second one is a little bit more interesting. Language, this is not true for every language, 
But for these three languages in particular, it gives rise to what I call dead code. Now you all are familiar with the idea of dead code from compilers or from if you have if zero, do a bunch of stuff. That's dead code. It will never be executed. That is not exactly the same, but it's akin to what I'm talking about here. And I think that it gets to the fact that I cannot reuse code that's written in any of these other languages. Take, for example, C or C++. Or if you want to pick one of the new up-and-comers, Rust. All of these happen to use the same calling convention, or at least similar enough calling conventions, that when people tend to, when people use those languages, I can interoperate with them. I can take the things that they have done and I can script it in Python. And I can use that to strengthen the ecosystem around us. In fact, that is one reason why the data, the data and science ecosystem around Python is so strong. is because there are lots of very specialized libraries written in Fortran, written in C, uh, that have been wrapped and are put together and scripted via Python. But I don't know, how many people have used, uh, how many people have used Java, JavaScript or Go? Almost everybody. There is a lar there's a large disconnect between these languages. They have a they have the tendency to force you into using that on that language. I was when I was looking at this. In fact, there was a uh, discussion about some how Java they really didn't like make the vol vol the venerable Unix utility make because it wasn't written in Java, and so they wrote ant. I will not comment on the relative <laughs> virtues of ant versus make. Oh man. <laughs> but I can say I can use make. <laughs> I can't use ant. Or in a more or in a different sense, the calling conventions in Go. First of all, Go is all statically compiled. And so that means that there's no such thing as a, as a shared library in Go. I mean, they have libraries, but it's all essentially at the source code level because you can't call out to a set of, of a, a, a set of code that has been provided to you in binary form or shipped with, shipped with your distribution or operating system of choice. It just doesn't exist. Even more, Go doesn't even use the C calling convention. It uses the Plan 9 calling convention. Which means that even if I were to try and hook into it and put a wrapper around a particular Go library, I would need to be translating back and forth between the memory format of C and the memory format of Go. Now this doesn't mean that it can be done, and in fact it's one of the things that I'm playing with, but it's ugly and it's not one of the things that you would ever use in production. If we want to be able to continue to do things like scripting graphics pipelines, we need to be able to interoperate. And these three languages in particular are ones in which we cannot interoperate. So let's look at these. First of all, Java. It's kind of unusual to be thinking about Java as an ecosystem competitor because it has been around for a long, long time. And for a long time, I think the number one word that came to mind when I thought about Java was enterprisey. I mean, I took I took serious looks at Java back in the late 90s, and then in say 2003, uh, and then I've gone back and forth with it. And I tell you, I. It was more than anything else, it was my exposure to Java that really pushed me into the arms of Python. Uh, something about the verbosity of it. But it turns out that there are lots of things where it is becoming not only powerful, but useful to do things in Java. 
And I'm going to I'm going to talk about a quotient, which is I'm going to roughly define it as hackerness. And hackerness is the probability that a hacker, when deciding on a new project, will choose this particular language. And Python used to be almost at the top of the hackerness scale. But these things are changing. And so what happened that where Java has developed some of this? And I think that it came down to a series of uh, a series of very good choices and brute force money, brute force investment in various places. The first thing here is this idea of the corporate machine. Java has had relentless investment over a very, very long time by very, very well resourced uh, companies. And because of this, the JVM, for all that it feels like a hamster wheel starting up, is actually an amazing piece of technology. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, going to, I'm coming across as a little bit of an anti-Java bigot. I had, I had real troubles with Java. And my hobby is, as an aside, my hobby is natural language processing. And there are tons of really wonderful libraries that are only available in Java. And that I, and so when I go to it, it just always is so verbose. But the JVM is actually an amazing platform that is continuing to advance. They have put man centuries of work into it, trying to make it performant, trying to create, trying to make it uh, deployable, trying to make it useful in lots of cases. They have adopted and brought in lots of the, the recent work in programming language theory, uh, theory work. They brought in lambdas, they brought in intermediate value types. Uh, they have really a really nice threading model where they've been able to adopt this, in, uh, adopt this and make it work over a broad variety of, uh, of operating systems. What's more, the, from the old joke of Java meant write once, debug everywhere, they actually have a fairly consistent uh, the user runtime that me means that you are fairly insulated from the operating system and you can run and ship quality software in Java. I think that the next thing that happened was actually the Apache Software Foundation. I'm not quite sure why. I don't. I was not involved with the ASF at this point, but it turned out that fairly early on there were a number of projects in Java that caught the attention of the ASF and became early members of the Apache community. And Java has, and Apache has been a mainstay of Java ever since. In fact, I think that this was one of the core things, core reasons that Java has become so big in mobile. Uh, if you trace back the history of Android, it went from Android through Apache Harmony to some of these very early Apache Java projects. What's more, the Apache Software Foundation was a group of people who were working together to advance new and interesting and open use cases where they developed a body of code that was open for other people to experiment on. This, it escaped the pure corporate world where it already had lots and lots of force and lots and lots of marketing, but it became, but the open libraries that were, that were created for a lot of these ASF projects actually made it so that there was code to learn from, code to work on, and projects and, and people that started to build this more full-featured ecosystem. Which led us to Android. Back in 2006, they made the choice to, even though it wasn't running on the JVM, it's running on Dalvik or upcoming, uh, uh, upcoming art. They made the decision that Andro the Android folks and later Google made the decision that the primary programming language for the Android uh, software would be Java. Now, I don't think that anybody, particularly, this is right before the iPhone launched. 
uh, their primary competitor that they were that they had their eye on was actually the BlackBerry, which coincidentally also ran Java. They ran Java uh, J2ME. I don't think anybody really realized the revolution that was coming in mobile. The fact that we would have computers as powerful as my, with as much RAM, as much CPU capacity, as much storage as my desktop computer in 2001, and we would carry them around regularly in our pocket. No one really anticipated this, that, that it would happen on that short of a time frame. And having Java be the foundation of the Android ecosystem, which was being pushed very aggressively, uh, made it so that it was the, you know, Objective-C got, was out there, it got the boost from Apple, but on a, uh, on a volume basis, more people were being introduced to, to Java than anything else. Which brings us to today. And we started to get things because of all this in the big data ecosystem where Hadoop was made in Java. That led to a bunch of, a bunch of other pieces of the quote unquote big data ecosystem like Spark, like Storm, where people started taking these other JVM languages like Scala and building them on top of the JVM. And all of this combined together to create what I said, what I call here acceptable hackerness, where I think that as evidenced by that Python paradox, uh, that, that Python paradox talk that I, I referenced earlier today, where Java was solidly not interesting to hackers a decade ago, it has become the language of choice for many, many very smart people. So, what next? Node. Now, this is an interesting one because, now I use Node because JavaScript doesn't really have a logo. And what's interesting is that JavaScript in some ways doesn't even have one community. It has, it, it is simply part of the air we breathe. Uh, JavaScript really grew up on the back of the web. And this, this has become an increasing systems competitor. And so I took the same look at, at JavaScript in the, in the way we took a look at, um, uh, took a look at Java. And there were similarly a couple different things that I thought led to this particular uh, level of hackerness. The first is, like I said, ubiquity. The web already in the late 90s was the most widely deployed software platform in the world. And every, everyone saw the writing on the wall that it was only, only going to get more and more prevalent. But I think the thing that really was the tipping point was Gmail. How many people remember when Gmail was released? How many people remember thinking, it's April 1st, this is actually an April Fool's joke? Uh, yeah, a lot of people don't remember that it was actually released on April 1st, where they thought, a gigabyte of storage, that's, that's crazy. But what's more, it was, the f I think, the first time there was a serious widespread application where there was heavy, heavy JavaScript on the front end, in, but done in such a way that it felt, uh, it, it felt acceptable. It was an acceptable substitute for a local application. People took a look at this, and I remember seeing a number of different uh, discussions of the JavaScript code that was behind Gmail, where people realized, hey, this is, these are ways in which we can turn around and we can make excellent applications that get delivered over the web. It, people had already, already known that this was possible to do in theory, and people had tried, but I think that Gmail was the first time that people actually succeeded and said, this is something that, which I would use in preference to my local, uh, local mail agent. Which, it was wildly successful. I remember that they, they 
you couldn't get Gmail invites for a while. For it was a, it was very excited, exciting to uh, have those handed out. And Google decided, you know what, we need to go all in on the web, and in particular, that meant they needed to go all in on JavaScript. And so they took. Uh, they took the code that had been developed for for Safari and they they brought it out and they made Chrome. Now who remembers when Chrome was released? There were two things that Chrome <coughs> there are two things that Chrome had where they said if you care about these two things you should be using Chrome and not any other browser. The first was the multi-process security model. They said, "We won't lose all of your stuff when one of your when one of your tabs crashes. We are more secure than anyone else." But the second one was, "We are faster than anyone else, and particularly, we are ten times faster at running JavaScript." And in particular, they said, "This makes us a better front end for modern web applications that use heavy JavaScript, such as Gmail." And people bought it. At that point, Internet Explorer was fairly old, <laughs> and uh, and Firefox had been accumulating a little bit. It had had a slower pace of development and was accumulating. A, uh, it was getting a little tubby. And so, and these were things that you really couldn't get anywhere else. And so people bought into it. But this, the gauntlet that they threw down that said, we are faster at JavaScript, we are 10 times faster at JavaScript than anybody else, really started a war. And I don't know if you all are familiar with the site, Are We Fast Yet? It's still up if anyone wants to go to arewefastyet.com. This is a site where people started benchmarking their nightlies, the, the Mozilla group started benchmarking their nightly uh, builds of Firefox against Chrome, saying, we need to become fast. It has suddenly become important to us to become really, really fast at JavaScript. And there was a whole range of, again, man centuries of work put into the underlying VMs for, for JavaScript in a number of different ways, really interesting ways, that led to JavaScript becoming a really surprisingly performant language. Uh, one of the interesting things is that some of the, one of the things I never would have expected was Inscriptum. Uh, Inscriptum is an LLVM based compiler that takes C and turns it into JavaScript for running on the web. I would not have uh, any time, if you would have said to me this is a viable path at any time past pre prior to like two years ago I would have said that is an amazing hack. Wow, good job. What will people ever use it for? Turns out that people are actually using this to start delivering code, which is astounding to me. Because JavaScript has gotten that fast. In fact, if you want to see an interesting perspective on JavaScript, I'd recommend Gary Bernhardt's uh, The Birth and Death of JavaScript is available on the web as a video. That also led us to Douglas Crockford. Douglas Cockford, at this time, back in the mid 2000s, was working at Yahoo on the front end, and he had brought together all of these. He had looked at what was happening to the front end of the web, and he started to talk about what is the core of the language that really you should pay attention to. And he wrote, uh, "There's a great picture where it has JavaScript, the definitive guide, and JavaScript, the good parts." And he said, these are the good parts of JavaScript that you should use and you should reuse. And he defined the small, tight core of JavaScript that everyone pretty much agreed on. Uh, and one of those I thought that was, I think, especially important was that it was invented and asynchronous from the ground up. Now this came really from its web-based background where you sort of had to do that. 
Uh, you Back then, you only had one thread of, of execution, and stuff happened in JavaScript because of some event. But that meant that when JavaScript made the leap from the browser into other areas, there was no other interaction model. You had to you have to work hard to actually get blocking calls in JavaScript. And so unlike the situation in Python where you have where blocking calls are really the default and you have to work in order to have some sort of evented or or continuation based architecture and there are various ways of doing this there's g event there's twisted there's etc in javascript there's only one way to do it and they actually because they because this constraint was forced upon them they actually turned it into a positive because all of their libraries were designed to work this way and so you didn't feel the and you still don't. You don't feel the imp impedance mismatch associated with trying to force evented, uh, evented interactions into a non-evented language. You know that the event loop is always there, no matter what you're doing, and so you can rely on it. And when you can rely on it as part of the core, it becomes very, very powerful. In some ways, the event loop was the core thing that made JavaScript be able to grow its ecosystem because you could hook into it at any point and everyone knew how to extend it. There was one final thing, and I've got it up here. It's JSON. People had learned from Java mostly that they didn't like XML, or at least they didn't like XML as the do everything format. And they said, instead, we would like to just have something that our, that, that we can just eval. And the amazing thing is that the standard format for JavaScript is something that's roughly equivalent to sending Python over the wire and evaling it. And because they had built in this sandbox to begin with, that actually worked. And so JSON became a preferred data format for all sorts of things because it was really easy to read, really easy to write. Uh, you, could, you could dump and reload. You could serialize state. You could move things between server and client very easily. And so even in places outside of JavaScript, JSON became the format to use. I think it's the most widely used serialization format in the world right now. That's sort of amazing that everyone else, almost everyone else, offers serialization to JavaScript. Which, again, led to this idea of, if I've got this idea, if I want to build something that is evented, that is responding, that is interacting with a browser, or which needs to respond to lots of events, maybe I should think about JavaScript. You know, there was a great, uh, there was a great discussion by Jacob Kaplan Moss, uh, who wrote Django, where he was talking about the, the benefits of JavaScript over Python. And the thing that he said is that he needs to go back and forth between Python and JavaScript, back end and front end, tens or even a hundred times per day. And each time he says, I need to mentally swap out my thoughts because otherwise there's a few minutes where I'm, I'm putting semicolons in my Python or I'm, or, or, or I'm not properly, uh, or I'm not properly, you know, putting my curly braces in my JavaScript or something. He feels, the, he feels sort of that stack swap every time he needs to move back and forth. And that's a real benefit for using JavaScript on the front and the back end. And it's one of the reasons why we like to have Python in, uh, in almost anything, because it, it makes it easy to use. If you can use one tool set across a large number of domains, it makes it really easy to interoperate. Uh, it makes it so that it fits your brain. And that's one of the things that, due to the ubiquity of the web, that JavaScript really has going for it. But that brings us to, I think, the final ecosystem competitor, and that is Go. Now, this is the one that, in some ways, I'm most worried about, because this is the one where I see people act 
actively leaving Python to re-implement or to start working in Go. So how did Go get so big? Because frankly it's a very young language. But I think that it got there by, the, by virtue of having very good parents. Uh, starting with having your creator be Rob Pike is something that very few languages can say. <laughs> it's, it just, and not only was it Rob Pike, but he was doing it at Google for solving Google scale problems, which is kind of inherently pretty sexy. But he also set, took a lot of these things and he made a language that was pragmatic. In the 2010 Programming Languages, Programming Languages Conference, where Go was introduced, the very first question that they, they presented Go, and the very first question that was raised from the audience was, so, Mr. Pike, why have you created a language that ignores the last 30 years of programming language theory, theory and research? And he said, broadly paraphrasing, because I'm making something that is good for solving problems, not for good, not just good theoretically. And turns out that he was right. He has distilled in a remarkable way a lot of the things that frankly make Python very good. It's Go is small, it fits your brain. It's got some very, very nice abstractions. In particular, the ideas of channels and Go routines built into the language at a very, very core level as a means of dealing with concurrency and parallelism is something that is, I think, the very best model for dealing with these things that in any language, with the possible, uh, with, with the possible exception of domains in .NET, which I also really like, but it's not caught on to the same extent. But he also said, you know what, this is not, this is something that's going to be a low-level systems programming language, but I am going to include higher level constructs like GC, I'm going to include things like uh, dicks, lists, proper strings. The, these are going to be something where it is relatively easy to use. In fact, Go doesn't feel like, hey, I took C or C++ and added some syntactic sugar on top of it, or removed some of the more difficult parts. <clears throat> Go actually feels more like Python, where you've taken out some of the things, excuse me, that make it difficult to compile and difficult to go fast. And they've pared it down to those, to those bits. And so they actually make, uh, it feels almost like a dynamic language, which is a huge accomplishment for something that is as low level as Go. Another thing that they did is, that I think is positively brilliant, is Go format. For all of the things that people will fight about, formatting source code is one of the most ridiculous. And yet, I understand it's important because software is made to be read and part of productivity is reading it. But what he did here is that at one stroke, he said if you do not, in, if it does not look like what Go format outputs, you are wrong in terms of your indentation. Which all of a sudden made Go surprisingly readable. What's more, he built in the ability to, to have very quick edit, compile, run cycles, both because he optimized the language for, com for quick compilation and because he built into the Go executable this idea of Go run, which is compile this quickly, run it, give me the output. And it goes so quickly that a lot of people are, it, it, it's, it's somewhat confusing in, in some ways because it feels like you're using a dynamic language. And you actually get angry because you actually want it to be fully dynamic and you want to be able to introspect on it and you don't realize, hey, 
I need to actually build in my introspection. I can't just go explore into the middle of my Go executable and look at the state like you can in Python. But it feels so close to a normal REPL, uh, read, execute, what does REPL stand for again? Yeah, read about print loop. Uh, that you can get confused and be uh, and feel like you're working in a dynamic language. The final thing that Go got really right, this may not have been right 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, but they got right deployment. The idea that you put everything into one binary, it's statically linked, and you drop it, and it runs. This is a great deployment story. This is so much better than what we've got. Uh, the, I think that deployment is one of the underrated things in, frankly, in, in Java and in, uh, and in Go. In Java, it wasn't intrinsically good, but they've got these, uh, the, uh, these idea of the war file where you just drag and drop it and boom, it reloads. It's really cool. But Go, if you want to build the sorts of web-centered applications, small, purpose-built, statically linked executables that you drop in Go is the very, very best way to, to do it. And it incurs very low runtime overhead, or it incurs very low system administration overhead. It is brilliant. And it's one of the things that, frankly, we don't do right, and we've been struggling with for probably 10 years, and we're getting closer, but we still have problems with. Finally, speed. This is one thing where Python has always been fast enough. And I believe that for almost everything, it is fast enough. But there are certain times when it's not just, speed is not just, hey, it runs the programming language benchmark X percent faster. It's also about memory efficiency. It's also about, uh, we've been talking about all these things that relate to speed of programming. But sometimes you just need capability. We've got an experimental fork of OpenStack where certain pieces of it have been rewritten in Go. Uh, OpenStack is written primarily in Python, and the Go version is about three times faster and uses about 15% of the memory. That's pretty impressive. And it was done primarily by one or two people working sort of in their part time. That is a powerful incentive combined with the ability and ease of deployment to trying to build things in Go. So, let's return to Python. What can we learn? The first is that I think that we need to keep investing in, uh, we, we need to keep investing in the places where we have warts, where we know that we have them. Because one thing that these languages have done for us is they have clearly shown us where we have problems. We need to keep investing in the, in the various interpreters. That's one reason why I'm so excited about PyPy and the, uh, the software transactional memory. That is something that is cutting edge that's happening in the Python ecosystem. That's why the advance of, uh, of Iron Python, Jython, those things are very important, as well as the continued evolution of the C Python interpreter itself. I also think that we need to really get serious about solving the deployment problem, including some way of really making sure that we can just drop something on a file system and make sure it runs. Because that is increasingly going to be the way that stuff goes out. Now, is there a problem with Python? Yes, we're not perfect. But we also have some strengths that I would like to, to point out. First is, we do have this huge ecosystem. There is more integration of Python with other, with other software than any other language, I believe, excepting C. C is sort of like the substrate that everything runs on. But we have an incredibly broad ecosystem, and that ecosystem is not just in code, it is in people. It is in people who know these things. We also have a very strong sense of aesthetics. 
this is something that is being adopted by some some other communities in particular like I said go format I think is an expression of this same idea but no one else has this thought of being Pythonic of having true there's one really right way to do something that is idiomatic that is good other people have this idea of what is modern C++ and you ask 10 people and you'll get 12 answers uh, you look at C and that that's out there Java you have you're forced sort of into the style but there it isn't there are still there's still quite a bit of variation we also have this idea that Python is an excellent teaching language, which will continue to drive its, its adoption in lots of ways, in lots of ways, including by helping it make, be easy. But the final thing that I want to say is that Python is not ultimately about the bits that are on all everyone's computers. Python is the Python community, and that means it's the people. There was a series of tweets, uh, I think about a month ago now, where some, someone was saying, I don't remember about which community, saying, I wish that people were nicer. And someone from the Python community reached out and said, you know what, yeah, or someone reached out and said, you should really look at the Python community because they, they are active in reaching out to others and being accepting and pulling others in and bringing out the best in the people who are there. I'd like to say that this sort of <coughs> gathering is something that you don't see in a lot of other language communities. You don't see community-led, caring people just coming together for the love of it in a nearly as great a number as we have in the Python community. You don't see the levels of engagement by women, by, by other minorities, by people across the globe. That's one of the things where that's the strength that we have. And I think that if we keep that, if people continue to say, I choose Python because of the Python community, then we will always have a place. Because ultimately, the people are what make that ecosystem run. You know, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here. It is truly an honor to be associated with all of you. And that's it. Okay, thanks, man, for that very, um, very good um, intro. Um, we haven't really got any time for questions, but if anyone wants to ask a quick couple of questions. And